Okay. Um, the PowerPoint is purely meant to aid where the accent is a, a problem. You know, I, I think that God is a genius. Abi, how can God understand the Nigerian saying, wait till they go? A South African who says, my country. A Zimbabwean who can't distinguish between sent and send. I will not go to Malawi where we don't, we mix L and R. And uh, the love of God means the love of God. You know, God is so gracious, he even understands Africanus, you know. Yes, sir. So, and he understands those French people. When they want to say, give someone something to do, they say, responsibilize them. <laughs> Look. Hey. God understands Zulus. He understands Tosas. He understands Abaswati, who have removed the Z out of it. So Zimbabwe, how, why would you say Zimbabwe and Swati? Zimbabwe. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Reverend Chikane, I agree with you that any attempt to personalize God cannot work. Because would you make him a Swati God without the Z's? Would you make him a Shona God who takes out the T's? Would you make him a Ugandan or Malawian God who mixes the L's and the R's? It wouldn't. So today we wanted to talk about our advocacy and being a prophetic voice. Like in any dissertation, allow me to start with the abstract. An advocate generally is a champion, an agitator, a representative, a sponsor, an activist, a protagonist, a promoter, a voice, a vision of values carrier. Someone who carries a vision, carries a message, or someone who represents on behalf of. So there's no singular style of advocate. So when I first came into the sector, I was quite shocked by the level of ignorance that pervades the sector. So I met a group of men and women who were calling themselves the voice of the voiceless. So I said, ah, there are people without voices. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, I want you to understand. <laughs> I want you to understand a bit of that. Huh? So an advocate, to advocate is to ask someone somewhere to do something about something somewhere or a thing right let's simplify it because we can go to all to advocate is to ask someone somewhere to do something about someone you know, something a thing which could be an institution an issue that, uh, that that bothers you so advocacy really, if it is done from a spirit-led perspective, must have a starting point. And the starting point is understanding a scripture that I love dearly. So since I didn't come to preach, uh, Reverend Chikane was supposed to preach, so now I'll be Brian Chikane for five minutes. <laughs> In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, the Bible says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew and approved of you as my chosen instrument. Or where it says instrument, say advocate. And before you were born, I separated and set you apart, consecrating you, and I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And then I said, ah. Right, that has to be said in Shona or in pidgin English. Then I said, ah, <laughs> Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, say not, I am only a youth, for you shall go. Now, here is a bit about advocacy, and Reverend Chikane told you about it. It says, but 
But the Lord said to me, Say not, I am only a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I shall send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Can I repeat that sentence? Because everything we say, But the Lord said to me, Say not, I am only a youth. For you shall go to all to whom I shall send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. So not this. It's about being sent and being commanded and speaking. Sent, commanded, and speaking. He says, be not, be afraid of them or their faces. For I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Here is the catch uh, in what Reverend Chikani was saying. The Lord would not say, don't be afraid, if there was nothing that would make you afraid. <laughs> A prophetic voice to the nations must contend with the primary possibility that there will be terror or things that cause fear. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day appointed you to the oversight of the nations. I want you to get this. A nation is not a state. It is not the geographic space that's bounded by a border. A nation is a collective of people who share an identity but who may defy the limits of state boundary. Can I say that again? The Bible says, for you are a royal priesthood, a new nation. That means you being your white, black, green, yellow, short, tall, whatever your appearance may be that will rot when you die, you are a nation that lives in eternity, right? And that nation is new because it is joined together by shared values, by shared identity. Yeah. Uh, are we together? Yeah. So the first thing the Lord said, I will send you, was to those who share values and identities. He didn't say whether those values and identities are good. All right? You are just sent to the nations. And he says, he is giving you oversight over the nations. Now, Oversight over the nations. I want you to understand because when we're dealing with, with advocacy, you can only have oversight over a nation if you rule over it. It's getting complicated, right? I said you cannot have oversight on a thing that you have not been instructed to govern or to exercise dominion over. <laughs> Okay, and of the kingdoms. Now, he says you have oversight over nations and kingdoms. These are domains that are ruled by kings. Now, we know they are earthly kings. Now, the Bible has told us there are powers and principalities in the heavenlies over whatever domains. But the Lord says, I have given you oversight over kings that dominate particular territories. So, that's why... This crying over demons, spending half your services crying over demons seems problematic in terms of prophetic voice. Because have you ever seen a parent crying over a child? Oh, my child. My child. No, your child is your child. Oh. And I like to say, Nigeria, you don't go buy donkey. Eh? And then you go and buy millimil at the market. And people see you carrying a sack of millimil and your donkey is just walking on the side. Either the donkey is sick or you are sick. So, so, say prophetic voice. So, what you're supposed to do is the following in terms of prophetic voice. I like this. Jeremiah was asked to do the following in terms of prophetic voice. He was asked to root out. Say root out. Now, when you root out, that means the thing has roots. Its tentacles have grown into the soil. It is nourished. It is now indigenous or local to the way things are done. 
whether in the church or society, that thing has gone deep. Say deep. deep. The Lord says, you, prophetic voice, I've sent you to uproot. Sometimes injustice becomes so ingrained, theologized, ideologized, and spiritualized. And when the Lord sends you as a spiritual voice, he says, go and uproot. He didn't say go and complain about how deeply embedded violence is in South African society that our people are a wounded people, a wounded people who are hurt, and a hurt people hurt others. No, he says uproot the thing that has built tentacles into the soil. He didn't say when you get to Nigeria or Kenya or Zimbabwe, you cry about the extent of corruption and rot. He said if it has roots, uproot it. Okay, second thing says pull down. There are things that have been elevated by media, elevated by public opinion, elevated, and you must pull these things down. And there are things that have built themselves strong that need to be destroyed. The best illustration is when you want to drill where there are rocks and you want to drill a road through the mountains, you have to dynamite Blow it away. There are things you cannot attack by just rubbing them. Say, oh, poochie poo, oh, sweetie. Okay. No, no, no. Some things, being a prophetic voice to the nations means certain things have to be taken by. Uh -huh. It's not me, Reverend, it's them. Right? <laughs> now, overthrow, I need to say nothing. Dr. Shana here and his friends in Zimbabwe know this. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> coup or no coup, I know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Overthrow means to throw over, to remove out of sight, and to take out of sight through uh, uh, gentleness. Uh -huh, good. <laughs> then the Lord said to Jeremiah, don't just concentrate on the negative. I have set you to build and to plant. Now, for those of you who are theologians, you realize that you needed to know this. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 31, He who oppresses the poor reproaches, mocks, and insults God, his maker. But he who is kind, you know the rest. Proverbs 17, 5 says, And he who is glad at calamity shall not be held innocent or go unpunished. Now, here is what I came to tell you. When there is calamity in a nation, the fact that you can afford to be safe, and you can describe the calamity of the poor from the safety of your six-foot wall, and your nine security cameras and bodyguards and dogs, the Bible says, he who is glad or chilled, relaxed, cool, at calamity shall not be held innocent or go unpunished. <laughs> so this personalization of God does say we are prospering elsewhere. They have calamity. And these are the children of God. Means you are guilty of the same as the, those that are causing violence. Is there a scriptural basis for it? If you read Ezekiel chapter 18, 3 and Ezekiel chapter 3, you'll get to it. Ezekiel 18 says, say not again in Israel that the fathers have sinned. Uh, and the children are bearing the cost, right? <laughs> the soul that sins shall die. In the earlier scripture, it says, the person who does not warn an unjust person of their injustice or their sin or iniquity, and the person dies in that iniquity. The one who fails to warn them, right? The one dies in their iniquity, the one who fails to warn them, the blood of the dying iniquitous men shall be required at your hands. With those words of encouragement. <laughs> is is uh, Mudis uh, here, Reverend Mudis from Wachiri? Is he here? He's not here. He's not here. <laughs> With those words of encouragement, I wanted you to understand that God's pattern of liberation deals first not with symptoms, but with systems. God's pattern of liberation 
deals with systems. All right, and I'm going to explain that to you. David comes and kills an individual called Goliath. And you know that David, when he killed an individual called Goliath, he was serving a backslidden king called Saul. All right? And David goes through this process from Bethlehem. He comes to uh, Gibeah, from Gibeah to Adulam, from Adulam to... And he goes through this process of being made. And the Lord goes through this process with David because he wants to emphasize one thing. The system of God is alternative to the system of man. And God says to the first prophetic voice that appears in the choosing of David, after he has looked at seven sons that had been recommended by their natural father, God says to the prophet, do not choose according to your... That's the third principle. This advocacy is not based on things that are appealing to you. Being a prophetic voice can easily become your ideological prejudice or your class prejudice if you don't understand the following. I've been dealing with a lot of Christians, Reverend Chikane, that come and say, look, seven steps to success, five steps to this. And those things are good. Let me not knock them down. And how do you get people out of poverty? We are teaching them eight steps, seven habits. And I kept telling to them, as long as the structure of apartheid discriminated against the reverend and everyone that looked like it. It didn't matter how many seven steps to success you taught him. The system was designed to ensure he does not crawl out of poverty and inequality. Are, are we together? Prophetic voice. Stop this aesthetic fascination with hyperbole and statements that apply because you come from a privileged class a privileged background, or a privileged race, a privileged gender. There are girl children who can't go to school because their fathers think as soon as they turn 14, they must be married off. It doesn't matter how many seven steps to success you teach a young girl that's going to be married off to an old man who has a pot belly three times my old. <laughs> Say system. The church has too long mollycoddled, hugged pythons in order to make peace. Forgotten that a python, though it can be a pet in Thailand, the real essence of a python, when it gets hungry, it will constrict you and it will swallow you. The system of this world is not designed to hug and mollycoddle with the church. The Bible says friendship with the world is enmity with God and vice versa. Say prophetic voice. We are sitting around here describing social and economic problem in very, can I borrow a doctor at Shanathem? Esoteric terms. <laughs> you know, when I first went to his church, I, I, I was 19 years old. Now I'm in my 40s, way, And I, I heard him use this term. He says, You can't deal with the things of God nonchalantly. And I, I, but the problem is he didn't spell it. So I went to the dictionary to go and try and find nonchalant. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you getting me? So number one, David was an archetype of God. You are fascinated with the fact that he killed Goliath. You forgot a simple thing about David. He established a new order of worship. He established a new way of dealing with authority that had the authority appointed by God that had fallen out of favor. He said, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. The church today has been busy touching many souls, executing them, stealing their flock, burning their churches, bad mouthing. Say, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. Why was an anointed David running away from a soul who the Lord had rejected? Authority in God is dealt with only through divine principles. He does something else. David begins to establish a way of fashioning men who were depressed, who were debtors, who were the scum of the earth. And when we read about them after Adjulam, we hear they were the mighty men of David. True advocacy is a movement that turns nobodies into mighty men and women. The Canadian po poet Edward Markham asked the question, why build we this city's glorious 
if in the process the builder remains unbuilt. Yesterday the preacher said, look, this business is about building. Today, this morning, Dr. Shana told it's about building human beings who are like their maker. Ah, a system is made up of components. One of the key components of a system is values. Say values. values. Now, God calls advocates to different geographic and spiritual location. Daniel was an advocate for God, a prophetic voice serving a pagan king in Babylon. Oh, how... How many of you would have rejoiced to be made to serve a pagan king who was engaged in all sorts of sexual impurity and worshipping idols? And the Lord says, my purpose for you as a prophetic voice is to go and serve Neb, Kad, Nezah. And Daniel had to deal in that system with two things. How to defy uh, the things that are considered normal, the food and the wine of the system. How to get your nourishment out of a system that is non-corrupt. How to refuse the corruption of a system. (laughs) It's difficult when you are close to power to say no. Uh, It's difficult. Ask Rev. Tell them. You know when you are far saying God will promote you, he will make you. No, let me tell you. When they come with a bribe of $10 million and you have to stand up and say, no, I will not eat the king's food. And your children's school fees is not paid. And your church is being evicted for not paying rents. Then you will know. When you are poor, it is easy to have values. How do you abstain from privilege? This is Daniel teaches us. He refuses to worship the golden image. The image was big. It was made of gold. There are many golden images. When you listen to the preaching in the church, many golden images from the world about success, many golden images in the world about importance have come into the church. He was thrown into the fire. (laughs) And I wish... (laughs) He started singing that Benny Whaler song. Fire is burning. Fire is burning. It wasn't this Holy Ghost fire from Nigeria. Oh. This was fire, real fire. Ah. <laughs> you know, so, so, these days, there was a fire from heaven. Fire. Say, you don't want fire. Oh. Ah. <laughs> the, the Bible says it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the Lord. So if you go to Nigeria and Zimbabwe, they like calling fire. I said, ah, what is the problem? You have no electricity in your houses because the power company in Nigeria and in Zimbabwe are dysfunctional. Instead of fixing dysfunctional power systems, you are calling fire from heaven to deal with what? With a temporary matter. Call fire to provide electricity so that there is permanent solar from the Holy Ghost. (laughs) But Daniel, listen to me. When Daniel is thrown into the fire, when they're thrown into the fire, they say to the king, those young men, Our God is willing and able. But even if he doesn't, then we go to Abraham. Now, I like Abraham. Sex pastor. You know, when I first met him, I just said, you all don't know him. He's a rock star, the gentleman here. But I will tell you about him when I'm done. You know, know, Abraham, (laughs) Abraham is an interesting man. He was childless. No child. Say no child. And he was married to a very beautiful wife. She was so beautiful, she was called beautiful. (laughs) Sarai. (laughs) I mean, they couldn't find any other name. You know, not this thing you say. You know, cute in South Africa and Britain, it means ugly but interesting. Oh, you have a cute baby. No, I mean, she was genuinely beautiful. (laughs) Uh, Sorry, I I, I want you to get this in case somebody calls you cute. Mm. So... Abraham's name, Abraham's name was high and exalted father. Status without proof. State, high and exalted father, no child. His wife was called beautiful. Status married to aesthetics. Uh, are we getting somewhere? Status married to appearance. Status married to temporary things. And then God says, and let me change your name a little. 
because you are the problem of the modern church, why you need a prophetic voice. Your name shall no longer be high and exalted, Father. It's an unproductive thing. You are abstracted and removed from the people. You are abstracted and removed from God's purpose. You are abstracted and removed from the mission. He says, you shall now be called Abraham, which means father of many nations. If your advocacy is not producing nations of people who are convicted and convinced of the word of God, led of the Holy Ghost, you are a noisemaker, go and deputize the loudest noisemaker in your country because you have not yet arrived in prophetic voice. And then her, the, the, the wife's name was also changed, right? And then God, after he has changed the wife's name to princess, God then says to him, come out. Say, come out. Come you out. cannot do advocacy as compromised as you are. You, I'm talking to you as the church. You are heavily and highly compromised. You are highly compromised. The Bible says comparing one to the other, comparing each other, eh? comparing themselves to each other. They were foolish. Right. We sit in an Empower 21 conference. Hey, prophetic voice. Uh, third wave of Pentecost. No, 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 no. It's not going to happen, no. Because you're constantly comparing yourself to one. Even political parties unite. They do slate, reverend. Eh? You, you hear before the conference, they're going to kill each other. Then they say, mm, our rights to loot can only be protected if we stay together. <laughs> but you, you are more corrupt than I am. Can we reduce a little? <laughs> you, can't, you can't be president. We'll give you a small post. Eh? But minimize a little. Otherwise, our collective survival. Even politicians have the common sense. The Bible says, learn from the sons of wickedness, for they are shrewd in their dealings. Right? Competition and comparison. Abraham was told, leave your space, ethnic group, leave your familial space, your geographical spatial space. Go to a place where there are no boundaries. Can you say it with me? Go to a place where there are no boundaries. Now, that means there's no governance of the Holy Ghost. No, it simply means your upbringing does not restrain you. It means your prejudices that do not restrain you. It means your schooling does not restrain you. So the second story that Dr. Shana told me when I was growing up is that he knew this woman. They used to make chicken and tie it with a draw, piece of draw, string. And then she used to do it. Her daughter did it. Then the grandmother and four generations were doing it. So one day the husband of the latest couple asked, so sweetie, why do you tie the chicken before you put it in an oven? This is so unique. She says, I don't know. Let me ask my mother. Ask the mother. The mother said, I don't know. Let me ask my grandmother. Yeah. Grandmother didn't know. Let me ask great grandmother. When they found out, I said, no, the ovens in the 1920s were so small, so we had to tie it so that it could fit. <laughs> right. Get out of the things that have defined how you view the world, how you view other people, how you view other churches. Uh, that's what you needed to do. Then the Lord said, I will make you. Leave and I will make you. Say leave. leave. And I will make you. Amen. Until we exit one system, it is not possible to be made the alternative. If God wanted to make us within a particular system, Pharaoh, why did he bother taking the children of Israel out of Egypt? They were like computer disks. Or this, uh, their minds had been formatted by slavery. Their minds had been formatted by eating cucumber. Their mind had been formatted by partying or seeing their bosses party. Their first act after liberation, when God was trying to give them a law of how to be a prophetic voice, is they took the wealth that God had given them. They started having parties in their churches. They built an idol, which represented two things. One, the cherub has an appearance of a calf. But the Egyptian god has an appearance of a calf. They merged the image of heaven and the image of earth into one. Say prophetic voice. Prophetic. Now, you can say Abraham was this thing. But he said to Moses, the baby who was raised in Pharaoh's system. Is it possible that you grew up in a Pharaonic system? Everything in you. Moses tried to liberate based on the things he had learned growing up. And he killed a person. And the Lord sent him to the wilderness. To what? To forget. When he came back, the eloquent prince of Egypt was now stammering. Right? 
You all know this, right? What is the significance of this? God will not establish his system of liberty and liberation based on the principles and tools and approaches of Egypt. Just to mock Moses, who was used to chariots, he gave him nothing more than a stick. The man who was used to hearing 900 astro astrologers telling what's going to happen, he gave him a burning bush. <laughs> Talk about a fall from grace. When you read about it now, you think it was a great thing. But with the experience of Moses, man, this was a fall. After driving a Ferrari and the Lord blesses you with a tricycle. <laughs> <laughs> but Moses learned how advocacy works. Number one, he sends spies to go and spy into the promised land. Say, spy into the promised land. Spy into the land. Number two, what does he do after spies? He, before he leaves the land of oppression, he asks for a wealth transfer. And then he asks for God's protection, the Passover, the lamb of the Passover. Number three, Moses left that a slave mentality cannot be purged by wishful thinking. An addiction to sin will not go simply because you are away from sin. Sinners leave the world, come into the church, become sinning pastors. <laughs> and then the man Elijah learned how to be a prophetic voice. Elijah was like the rest of us. I'm the only one. I don't hear any other priest, anyone else in Zimbabwe or in South Africa speaking, I'm the only one. Then the Lord says, no, there are 100 men who have not bowed their knees. Say 100 who have not. Say 100 who have not bowed. Why did the scripture say? Why did they repeat it? <laughs> All I have said has mattered for nothing. All of you are doing exactly what I'm saying is wrong. You are following any statement that is said. So, let's conclude by saying, you've heard the scripture. Ask your neighbor. This is from Covey. Circle of concern, circle of influence, or circle of focus. Black, African, Latin American, and American churches spend half their time concerned about demons, about sickness, about... Have you ever been to church and 99% of the prayers were about money, about the husbands that have gone errant, children who've run away, and sickness? There's nothing wrong with praying for your children. How many of you have ever gone to a church and you've had people pray, God, money, rent, house, job, and so on and so forth? We are still in that circle of concern. To change a system... We need to transition to a circle of influence. <laughs> we cannot change a system without access to its levers of power. The Bible says you cannot spoil the house of a strong man unless you bind the strong man first. Say prophetic voice. Prophetic voice. Right? The next one is a circle of focus. What the church in this third Pentecostal moment, focuses on, will determine its extent of power and influence on the world. Can I, can I say that? What we are focusing on, what we are concerned with, will determine where we put our prayer energy, where we put our worship energy, where we put our theological energy, where we put our united focus. You cannot be a prophetic voice to nations that are moving to the fourth industrial revolution. Still worrying about how to, to arrest wizards and witches in Limpopo. No, come on. <laughs> now, if you are in Zimbabwe, they now have... Kids are not studying. Come and buy an anointed ballpoint pen. Yeah. 
Now, these false things are not the concern. When David found Goliath taunting the armies of Israel, the king was hiding, and so were the generals. David asked a question I would like you to ask today. Is there not a cause? First question. Is there not a cause? If there's a cause, then my brother, my sister, as spirit-led churches, we got to say like that man. You know, I like that story. The man defends a field of lentil. Now, I have to put it in Shona. It's beans. Lentil is no more than what? Beans. How do you fight for beans? <laughs> Risk your life for beans. If you was a modern pastor or a modern preacher, a modern evangelist, you would have run for dear life. Hey, the beans can take care of themselves. So at least I have my life. There are no things that are sufficiently valuable in our neighborhoods to fight for. We have stopped to see value in the next generation. We are not willing to put up this fight. We are tweeting. We are murmuring. We are complaining. I don't know any political party, Reverend Chikani, that has more than 3 million members. The ANC in this country one time said it had no more than 700,000 members. We have churches in this country that have over a million members. How is it that a 500,000 member organization can determine what a 5 or 15 or 20 or 30 million member constituency can or cannot do? If you don't understand your power, you'll be looking for the armor of soul. Whereas just the one stone you have because you practice killing a bear and a lion can fell Goliath. Goliath is no more than a noisy chick. Is there not a cause? And then he says, no, <laughs> the guy is wise. He was entrepreneurial. What shall be done for the man who kills this? Come and say it with me. What shall be done for the man who kills. When you fight a system, have an agenda. When you come against a system, when you destroy a system, you create a vacuum, not an alternative. When you remove a dictator, you create a vacuum of power. You don't create a democracy. Is there not a cause? Our churches are not developing leaders sufficiently. Our churches are not mobilizing resources sufficiently to influence the economy, to influence science and technology, to influence research. What we are raising resources for is we are still building brick and mortar because somewhere we missed the road. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Say, is there not a cause? And what shall be done for the man who says that? So I wanted to say to you, when you move to the circle, that circle, I'll skip everything else. It feels like this. Sorry, it feels like this. <laughs> the reality is, my friends, I can whip your emotions up. Right? You are hanging on a broken branch at the moment. And thank God for this conference. It's about restoration of the branch. The Bible says this, hallelujah, hallelujah, Amen. hallelujah, Amen. restoration. And that snake, you can make him devil, you can make him envy, you can make him anything you want. And the crocodiles and the power sharks are the things that are always constantly on the prowl. The church is under attack from the media. The church is under attack from false prophets. The church is under attack from poverty. The church is under attack from mental and ideological and ethical decadence. The church is under attack from foolishness. The church is under attack. <laughs> Not I said, I didn't say from the devil as yet. I said it's under attack from you. So, as, because we've spoken a lot, I wanted to end by, uh, I had a lot of things, don't worry about these things, I always do this so that you know that I thought about this, huh? <laughs> you know, you know, uh, that, that is the old story of Africa, eh? you see that? Eh? Uh -huh. Prophetic question.
There's poverty and injustice that Reverend Chikane talked about. Now is the time to speak and act prophetically. And poverty is not the same as being broke. A person who's broke can look forward to month end. We are impoverished by systems. We are impoverished by choices made or not made by those who govern us. Say system. 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 But we belong to a greater system. We belong to a greater kingdom. We belong to God. And what is it that we have come to do here? We have come to say to you, when people are poor, they can be bought by anyone and abused by anyone. But wealth creation alone does not solve the fallen state of men's heart of businesses that want to make profit without humanity. Of persons who want to steal and steal some more. It doesn't solve the problem of corruption. You can create wealth for the corrupt. You cannot create wealth for the cruel. The poor will never get it. They can work and according to the book of Amos, the rich will tip the scale. Because injustice functions on exploitation. We are fighting a system, but we are fighting exploitation by politicians, exploitation by business, exploitation by the church, exploitation by ignorance, exploitation by indifference. Having said this, I'm reminded of the story of a husband and a wife walking together. So they see donkeys, they'd had a quarrel. So the husband says to the wife, they are your relatives. <laughs> and the wife says, ah, oh, yes, by marriage. You know. <laughs> having, said, having said this, I want you to take away from this as we go away. God did not bring us into the world because you are scared of the problems. God knows that people are killing each other in South Sudan. He knows there's a problem in Central Africa Republic. He knows the African Union and other institutions can only pass normative frameworks. They don't have the capacity to change the heart of men from the evil that causes them to wield axes and machetes against each other. No, it's not just a bunch of Africans, lest you thought what manner of evil resides in the black man that he commits genocide in Rwanda, that he commits infanticide and violence. No, the men and the women who sell weapons to these men to kill children, to plant her, are not black. They are white, they are from your neighborhood, they are in your church. And they go to holiday in Honolulu and the Bahamas. Indifference to how we're exploiting natural resources. Indifference to how we're developing our neighborhoods. Indifference to how children and women are being trafficked. Indifference to the extent of the problem of narcotics trafficking. In Mozambique, it's becoming a southern corridor. And Zimbabwe and South Africa are in danger of becoming the launch pads. In the West Coast, some of those states have become narco republics. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Filled with power. My end is this. John the Baptist was a lovely man. John the Baptist was beheaded. Let me tell you why he was beheaded. He called Herod a fox and challenged him on a personal immorality issue. Not even a national immorality issue. How many of you believe you have your advocates? You still believe you are advocates? Yeah. Yeah, that Lord, the Lord has called you to speak power to the nations. You advertise heaven every Sunday. You go conning people, telling them to get born again because there's a better place where the Lord is, where there are mansions and streets of gold. You yourself are afraid to go there. The reason why you don't speak, you are afraid to be imprisoned. You are afraid to be abducted. You are afraid to be tortured. You are afraid. I know no hero, they say in Shona Reverend Chikane, that has no scars of battle. You cannot become a hero simply because you sat on Twitter, preached fire and brimstone from a pulpit. We have many cowards masquerading as heroes with principles on how to prevail in life. Test your faith in the battlefield. Show me your faith by your works. Let your works confirm that you are a man or a woman of courage. I'm not saying be foolish. 
I'm simply saying, be courageous. For the Lord said to Zerubbabel, be strong and courageous, O Zerubbabel. Nothing of God can be built without courage. Because discouragement will come, adversity will come. My friends, the Bible says, does any of you set to build a house or a mansion without first counting the cost? <laughs> Do you go to war against an adversary before you know what the adversary is? Systems have strengths and weaknesses. Until you understand their strengths and weaknesses, you can't exploit them. You have indulged me. I hope I've not insulted you or hurt your sensitivity. If I have, the Lord healed you 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Just before I respond, um, Dr. Shana here and uh, the Secretary General from AEA, often when they want to respond to persecution of Christians across the continent, there are very few Christian individuals and churches from Africa that are willing to take a position, contribute financially, contribute material things. Central Africa Republic, contribute to South Sudan, contribute to Congo. There's a crisis in Burundi right now, contribute to. So my own sense is one of the things I personally hope we can do. For those organizations, there's my sister there working with young people. For those organizations, that are working on this continent. One of the ways of showing unity is put your mouth, your money where your mouth is. And put your effort where your mouth is. There are challenges on this continent where a small intervention by the church would make a huge difference. Reverend Chikane has been going to all those places. He will tell you the carnage in Sierra Leone, the carnage that happened in Liberia, things that happened across this continent, Mali recently, Ivory Coast is that most of the interventions are actually not driven by spirit-filled churches. It's an indictment on us. This prophecy of hot air without substance doesn't work. With the measure that we give, we shall receive. We have not applied ourselves with love to this continent. We have allowed people to die. What happened in South Sudan is a travesty. Between 1982 and now, over 8 million people have died. In Congo, not far from here, where our people are doing business, we've had more than 5 million die over. And nobody's talking about Congo. And I think this is a sad indictment on all of us. Is it because they don't look like us? They don't speak our language. They will not come to our neighborhood. If they come, there will be xenophobia. Okay, let me not touch that one. My brother, you know, God is an amazing God. He says through Paul, I pray with the Spirit and I pray in my understanding. I've met folk who just want to do natural things to help without spiritual input. And those folk should really just be called NGOs. Nothing going on here. Okay? And I've met folk who want to do spiritual warfare. And after they've done spiritual warfare, will do nothing natural or physical to help. The Bible describes them this way. How can a brother who is in lack come in your midst and you say to him, go and it shall be well with you and you do not give him things to sustain his body? Or Jesus put it in a more revolutionary manner. And in that day, many shall come and say, Lord, Lord, Lord. And I shall say to them, depart from me. I never knew you for I was hungry. You did not feed me. I was naked and so on and so forth. Spiritual warfare must always be accompanied by applied faith. The balance of the church is we shouldn't be so spiritual that we are spooky and of no earthly good. Or so earthly that we are so of no spiritual good. You will uproot these things by applying the leadership of the Holy Ghost. Now let me demonstrate, I think the preacher last night and Reverend Chikane and others said this. In the book of Acts, which is a model for us. There was a problem, a crisis. The Grecian and other widows were feeling excluded and marginalized. And the Holy Ghost needed spirit-filled people, spirit-led people with good integrity. To do what? To wait on tables. To do spiritual warfare? No. To feed the widows. 
until the church goes back to the balance in the book of Acts that you can get baptism and see cloven tongues of fire touching people and afterwards still go and do tables that feed murmuring and grumbling widows. The church is not yet prophetic in its mission. Impacting the nations. Uh, look, I'm not worried about funny prophets. <laughs> Jesus said, a sower went out to sow. And then the enemy came and he sowed what? Heirs. And his servants came to him and asked, what shall we do? Because they wanted to spend their time removing tears. And he answered, he could only have answered in Zulu on Debele. Any other language would not have su sufficed. He said, let it grow with the weeds. <laughs> Because at the time of harvest, who is the Lord of the harvest? I, I don't know why we spend half the time focusing on false prophets. It is because the genuine product is not working. So we think we can get authentic by regulating the fake stuff. No, let's do more genuine stuff. When we are united and the Holy Ghost is working mightily amongst us. They shall be added to our number, 3,000 in one day, and more shall come to know Christ. As long as the genuine ain't working, ask us in the township. When the electricity is not working, you breach, ufage, you put it, aha, uh -huh. you understand. You don't go to a super mechanic. Get the genuine to work. That's my, my, because there's a lot, I go everywhere. There are too many false prophets. They are making people drink diesel. What are the genuine ones doing? There are too many fake prophets. Too many. Look, my friends. The time for genuine Christian revolutionaries has come. I, I wonder, I don't know if Malema is born again, but how can one young man cause an entire nation and pastors to repeat on Sunday, give me a sign, mama? How? <laughs> Even in Zimbabwe, one person without the Holy Ghost, without the Spirit, can get the whole nations to follow them. And a person with the Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled, who reads the Word of God every day, is preached through three times a week, still can't get one ant to follow them. I call now. I, I, so now I have to, Reverend Shkane has to keep me in check. You know, Rev, the Israeli-Palestinian issue is just a name we have for describing what happened in the book of Acts. When prejudice has a justification. The Bible says there was a quarrel between Peter and Paul. Paul says, I confronted Caiaphas, or Peter, because when he was amongst the Jews, he behaved in a sectarian manner. And then when he was away from the Jews, he became an inclusive Christian. There's racism in the South African church. There's racism and tribalism in the Kenyan church, in the Zimbabwean church. See them when they are voting for leadership. Even nationalism. You come from South Africa, you are the best candidate. They all will band it together, not informed of the Holy Ghost. We can't have another South African. No, Israel, Palestine is a reflection of what is happening in the church. If we are going to speak out against it, let's speak out against one thing. Injustice wherever it happens, no matter who does it. Let's speak, because there is a sense that Nathaniel can no longer tell David because David is anointed, that by killing Uriah for his wife, you have done wrong. You are not touching the Lord's anointed. You are establishing the credibility of the Lord's anointed. So whether you believe that Israel is so chosen that it cannot be touched, the Lord says you shall not take life. Oh yeah. Whether you are chosen or not chosen, if a chosen man of God, pastor, who is flowing with the anointing that when he walks his shadow just causes all of us to fall, commits adultery. And you are a prophetic voice, my sister. 
Will you not go and say, man of God, you are anointed. You are special. Now this all, it's not in the law of God. We should not feel a sensitivity to calling injustice purely because we'll be politically incorrect. Thank you. Thank, th thanks, uh, Brian, for that. Uh, that obviously doesn't say that that's, that's the end of that. We, the Empower 21 will meet in Jerusalem in 2033. Uh, those who were there at the last meeting of Empower 21 remember the challenges that we faced. So we are hoping that between now and then, uh, in the way we do spiritual warfare, in the way we do advocacy, in the way we, we read our Bibles and seek the Lord's face about what to say and do, that there will be a way in which God releases the energy of Empowered uh, 21 community to be part of the solution there. Amen.